Hey everybody, Kent Walski here, checking in with another one of our hashtag Lower Decks review videos. Today, of course, we're going to be talking about Season 1, Episode 3, Temporal Edict. So what I'm starting to think is that every episode as it comes out each subsequent week is going to become my new favorite because this is now my new favorite episode. I really did enjoy this one quite a bit, especially when in comparison to the first and the second episodes. And that's saying a lot. The Lower Decks bar for the actual show itself has been kind of raised quite a bit since the very first episode. So for these episodes to continue to clear this bar, in my personal opinion, is showcasing quite a lot of talent and skill on the crew behind the camera, so to speak, the animated camera and, and all that stuff like that. So I really enjoyed this episode. There are a couple of really big standout moments, which I'll talk about, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some things that I had some theories around and maybe some things that I didn't like. Let's jump into it. Okay, so the show is definitely starting to really perfect those cold openings. We had one in the second episode, and now we really have one here in the third episode. And this one was really great. I really absolutely enjoyed the whole like river dancing legs that Boimler was doing at the beginning with the violin and he was kind of playing crazy and I like how it interfered with the Klingons and their kind of negotiations who thought I guess he would assume that there was like boss music playing in the background or something and then I loved the joke about <laughs> where he was like this song was about my mother and also ode to a hug also about my mother that was very funny I really laughed at that quite a bit and then of course Shaq's coming in there and breaking it because he thought he was the one that was being super loud that was great the cold opens are perfect what a great idea to kind of tie that back into more modern style comedy shows like Brooklyn Nine-Nine for instance is a good example of that but a lot of shows with that kind of camera angle kind of POV style of filming have used the cold opens in the past and I think it's great to bring that into the animated show. It was something that I didn't even think that they were going to do. I never even theorized that they were going to do that, but they did it. And I think it actually works really well. So right at the beginning of this episode, we get the A and the B plots kind of laid out pretty easily. Now, the B plot does generate itself based off of what occurs in the A plot. Of course, the A plot is the situation where the captain of the Cerritos has been passed over for a very important mission to Cardassia Prime for a diplomatic mission. So she kind of freaks out and puts everyone on overdrive mode once she realizes that the crew uses buffer time and uh, uses that to kind of skirt, you know, the whole, you know, completing things on time con. Concept. This was, of course, coined originally by Scotty, where he used to say this, you know, warp engine repair is going to take five hours, and then he would do it in an hour because he had always overestimated, creative estimating, as I think it was called. So that whole thing kind of comes to light to the captain. She gets really upset about it, so she puts everybody on, like, these weird time card things that they have to keep on super track of. So they all are constantly running around, running around, which causes a mishap on an away mission that the B-plot then takes off from, where we have Mariner and Rother, not Rutherford, excuse me, Mariner and Ransom, who's the XO of the ship. They get captured along with the away team because they brought the wrong artifact with them because the guy who was supposed to grab it was overworked. So that one, the B-plot generated from the A-plot, which I thought was a fun like little way to kind of keep the stories kind of moving. There is a lot of back and forth between the A and the B-plots in this episode. They're not running super far apart from each other and then directly connecting at the end, Whereas this case, they're constantly overlapping with each other. The A plot starts with the whole buffer time and the captain being passed over for Cardassia Prime. Then that overlaps and creates the B plot with the missing artifact, which then overlaps with the A plot because the aliens on that planet that are now pissed off about the missing artifact and have captured the away team send ships up to attack the Cerritos. And then the Cerritos eventually fights them back. And then, of course, the B-plot guys are able to get themselves out of jail. And it all kind of constantly overlaps. And then, of course, Boimler is able to figure out what it is that they need. And it, it's like there's a lot of overlapping between the two different plots in this one, which is a different dynamic than what we've seen before. The first episode was A, B, and C, where they all kind of connected very seriously at the end. Then in the second episode, we had an A and a B plot that's thematically connected at the end. And now this one had a lot of crisscross throughout the entire thing, which I thought was a really cool way of trying to write this story up a little bit. It felt maybe to some people a little bit disjointed, but I would guarantee if you watch it a couple of more times, you'll see those kind of cross stitches occurring between the two different A and B plots. One of the things that I really did enjoy is that as the crew from the A plot was like really working super hard with zero buffer time everyone was running around 
Boimler is just totally chill about it. And I don't think that's because he's not a human or that he's some kind of enhanced being. I think it's because he was working that hard already. He, there was no change for him. He really enjoys work. He likes sticking to the regulations. He likes working all the time. He even mentions that in this episode that he wished they could never take a break and that he wants to just always be working. So for him, the adjustment meant nothing, which I thought was really key to a point, uh, you know, a point to establish his character like that, but also to establish that the captain didn't actually go overboard necessarily. It's just that there, she's brought it up to a standard that not everyone is able to live up to, and, and that's okay. That's kind of the message at the end is that we're all human and not everyone is at the same level all the time and that is able to produce the same level of work all the time. And the idea is that everybody has to work as a team in order to get everything done, which I think is a really great uh, commentary on employer to employee workplace uh, relationships. It's really weird. I don't know what's going on. This is the second episode now where they've really commented on that kind of dynamic between employer and employees and workplace dynamics and stuff like that. So I don't know. I don't know if this is like a dig to some specific industry, but you know, animation studios in general are known to have that kind of issue as are video game developers and really even movie studios. So I don't know if this is like a little bit of a commentary on that or if it's just part of like the, you know, the overall thematic of the show of them just trying to be a family together. I'm not quite sure, but I did like the fact that Boy Miller's character was not really impacted by what was going on because he's just a workaholic and he loves doing that. I really enjoyed a lot of the interactions between Ransom and Mariner. My favorite one probably being the joke where he mentioned that she needs to roll down her sleeves because they don't work in a barn or a farm or something. That was really great, you know, because it's not really necessarily in regulations. She's got that, you know, O'Brien had like the sleeves kind of like half up, but she's got them full all the way up, which I think is, you know, probably still within regulation somewhere because you know, I, I doubt that she would be flagrantly doing that all the time without anybody correcting that, but uh, it, he obviously does not like it. So I really enjoyed that bit. The whole sequence with the crystal ships attacking the Cerritos I thought was great. I love the design of the crystal ships and especially the design of their landing craft. I thought those were really well done. Very kind of unique. I like how they kind of dig into the ship and stuff like that. I, I thought it was really great and that they kind of forced their way onto the ship with using spears. And so it's like swords and spears, but also with like ships that can shoot things and fly around and go warp speed. So I like the kind of dynamic there. I think it's pretty cool. Speaking of the crystal ships, the crystal beings and all the really the crystal puns, the geo jokes, like all that stuff, I really enjoyed it. This was a really fun way to kind of play up the tropes of specifically like original series aliens. That's definitely what they were going for here. And Mariner, I think, even made a reference to that with the spears. And I thought it was a really fun way to kind of bring in some comedy and levity to what is normally considered to be a very serious moment in a live action Star Trek film. But this one turned into a bit of a kind of parody almost, but in a good way. Like I laughed the most in this episode. I laughed a lot during the Mariner and Ransom back and forth discussions, even though that had a rousing kind of Starfleet undertone to it where he was like, I'm the, I'm the XO. You're part of my team. I'm responsible for you. So I am going to fight this, even though she may or may not have been better. It's irrelevant. It's his job. I thought that was great, but I liked the dynamics that they were representing there. And then, of course, this potential romantic dynamic. So that was great. And then him getting out there, playing again into those TOS kind of tropes where he rips his shirt off, throws down the sword, and just gives him the old Kirk hands. He kept saying Kirk hands and like Kirk block and Kirk Perry. And it was just, it was great. He just kicks the hell or punches the hell out of this monster with his double fisted Kirk hands. And it was perfect. It was just so great. I was actually kind of worried that they weren't gonna go in that direction, which I'm so glad that they didn't. I thought he was gonna get out there with the shirt off and then he was going to have to give it the business and then the monster was going to beat him up and then Mariner was going to have to save him, which I would, which, which would have been a different, I'm, I'm just glad that they didn't do that because it was important. I feel like for Mariner's character, not just the audience, but Mariner's character to see that Ransom is able to handle his own business. She accuses him of not being able to handle it and he goes out there and he just crushes it. So it proves her wrong. It showcases his strengths and it also showcases that Mariner sometimes isn't right. And we did kind of touch a little bit on it in the first or second episode, but she kind of outclasses Boimler in a lot of ways because she has a lot more experience. But when she comes up against the XO of the Cerritos, she is clearly un unclear as to what his capabilities are and where his strengths and weaknesses are. And he goes out there and just whips that monster's butt. So I'm so glad that they did that that way because it really helped, I think, elevate the Mariner character quite a bit. 
by not having her do anything, which is important sometimes where she has to just sit there and let other people kind of save the day. And I thought that was a really genius move on their part. So I know a lot of people, when this show came out, they were concerned that Mariner was going to be a Mary Sue and Boimler was just going to be this fumbling idiot. Uh, here we are in episode three and Boimler is actually the one who saves the day. In fact, he gets an entire you know, temporal edict kind of called off, named after him, which we'll get to the title here in a minute, but he saves the day. He's the one that snaps the captain back to reality. He's the one that figures out what's going on because he was unimpacted by the whole time stamp thing with the pads and trying to work super hard and all that stuff like that. It, it did not impact him in the same way. And he was able to see through all of the nonsense, as the captain put it, a child's eyes, which is so rude, so very rude. But she was able to come back to reality and essentially rally the crew to save the ship from the crystal people, as they would say. And I, I thought that was great. Mariner didn't do anything in this episode. She attacked a couple of people at the beginning, but ultimately she really just sat in the back seat this episode and it was Ransom who was the one down there saving his team, including her and doing what she needed to do. And she still got busted for it later because a lot of people with the whole Mary Sue thing is, is that they get away with everything and everybody loves everything that they're doing immediately. Ransom definitely does not love everything that she's doing, even though I think there's some tension there now sexually there. But she still got arrested and thrown in the brig for not rolling her sleeves down from the Joker early in the episode, which is these all things that are flying in the face of the Mary Sue trope. But I think that it's important to showcase that, yeah, she's super skilled at a lot of weird things that Boimler isn't aware of, but she also sucks at a lot of things when compares to a much more seasoned officer. And I think this is a great way to kind of remove a lot of those doubts that Mariner is a Mary Sue. And to her friends, she may appear to be a Mary Sue to them. Maybe that's what the kind of construct here is, is that to them, she's like this, especially Boimler, she's like this really great officer. I think he even said that in the second episode, that she knows so much, but when she's compared to somebody that knows a bit more, eh, it doesn't really necessarily hold up to scrutiny by a seasoned officer. So I thought that was really great. I really absolutely enjoyed that whole dynamic kind of getting played out and that Boimler was the one that saved the day. And I think he really needed that. I think we as the audience who are supporting these characters really wanted to see something like that. And we're only in the third episode. So I can't wait to see what his arc is throughout the entire season. Remember, this is his first year in Starfleet. So being able to say that he saved the ship within his first year is pretty good, I think, for somebody with a young career like that. So I can't wait to see what his full arc is kind of maybe coming into his own and growing more confidence. And then maybe Mariner, based off the end of this one she seemed to be um a little bit more uh, uh uh acceptable to the idea of starfleet after her whole interaction with ransom and she kind of i think she said like you know you reminded me what it feels like to be in starfleet or whatever so we may be seeing some of her arc kind of get back into the to the ring of moran of things and i don't think it's going to completely destroy who those characters are in a way that they become unrecognizable in any way, shape, or form, but I think that it's important to see where they're at at the beginning of the season and where they're going to be at at the end. Speaking of the end, we also got a fantastic time jump way into the future, and before anybody starts trying to bust out their timeline infographics and stuff like that to update where this took place on the timeline, there is no information about it. I, I my, my personal assumption is that it should either be taken simply as a stinger joke, and it shouldn't be necessarily considered anything more than that, or it's just set so far in the future that it doesn't matter. So don't get your, don't get your, uh, you know, Starfleet panties in a bunch about it. Just let it go. It was just a fun little ending thing here that tied into Boimler's character being pro progressively forever remembered as the guy who was the laziest person in all of Starfleet because he had the Boimler effect, which is another term for the buffer time, which is another term for the whole Scotty effect where they just add hours onto things in order to kind of squeeze in some extra time to do whatever they want. So he became the known as the laziest officer ever. Ever He got a fun little plaque with the Akuta plaque on there, which was great. And this school in the jungle, which definitely resembles that of Hoshi's school from Enterprise, is set in the far future. We've got a Borg baby there. We've got a Cassian kitten there. We've got all these little babies there. And then after they're done talking about Boimler, they cut over to Chief Miles O'Brien, who's apparently the most important member of Starfleet ever, which I... I don't know about that. We're going to have to fight about that. But I definitely believe that this was a deep cut lore reference to the webcomic O'Brien at Work, which is... 
crazy to think about the level of detail that's going into these episodes. There was a lot of references in this episode as well as all of the others. And honestly, I, I'm looking forward to the Blu-ray commentary from Mike McMahon and company that will sit down and go through all of the Easter eggs for us <laughs> in all these episodes because I feel like there may be even some that we're still missing. Like, there's a lot going on in this show overall. Like a lot of meta jokes occurred in this, you know, in this show. You know, we had the O'Brien webcomic thing, which is very meta because that's essentially just an internet meme. And then, of course, we had Boimler humming the Next Generation theme song inside of the turbo lift when he meets up with the captain, which is quite interesting, I think. And I, I like the idea of doing a bit more meta. I hope it doesn't get super meta, but I think the, the, the idea of doing meta commentary like that is a good way to kind of help continue to push the show away from being judged too literally because, you know, it's not like you're going to see, you know, people inside of a live action Star Trek humming the TNG theme song. It would be kind of strange, but here it works very well because it's animated. And I think that this does help to kind of differentiate itself, continuously differentiate itself from what's going on inside of the live action show. So I think it's very smart. They just got to make sure they thread that needle appropriately. All right, guys and gals, that does wrap up my kind of things that I enjoyed, review, overview, whatever you want to talk about video piece. I struggle to find things that I dislike about these episodes. You know, it, it is it is a challenge for me. It's And it's not just because I'm trying to just suckle on the teat of CBS and I, you know, I, I just want them to like me. No, it's this episode and this series is becoming more and more difficult to find things that I dislike. You know, I, 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 I don't know. It's, it, it is, it is a bit of a struggle. You know, I really did enjoy this episode. I would say the only thing that maybe could have been done a little bit better was I, I feel like we didn't spend enough time with necessarily all of the characters in this one. And the only reason I say that is in episode two, we got a lot of growth for who those individuals are and what their dynamics were. But in this one, it felt like we only really got a bit of growth between the dynamic of Boimler and the captain and uh, Mariner and the XO, which may potentially just be the case for this episode. But I'm kind of like, wanting to see what's going on more with Rutherford and Tendi uh, than I am with these characters and their relationships with the senior officers. But that's barely even a criticism. That's just more like an observation. So again, I am really struggling to find things that I super dislike about these things. There's just a lot to enjoy it. I really am still enjoying it very much. Every time you know Thursday rolls around, I'm super pumped. I'm excited to watch them. I'm excited to watch them again and again and again over the, you know, just 10 times over. I'm really just enjoying the show like so much. I just find it super entertaining. So one thing I do want to go ahead and touch on though is the name Temporal Edict. A lot of people, when I think when they saw this name, including myself, when you say temporal something to people in Star Trek, they immediately think time travel. They think time travel. So people were really expecting a time travel episode. And this definitely subverted that expectation a little bit by really kind of playing with the two words there, temporal and edict. So this kind of, for me, had two kind of big meanings. The temporal edict, I think, is actually a reference to the, you know, the, the, the rules that the captain created. This was the edict of no buffer time. You need to be constantly worrying about your time and making sure that everything is done on time and that, you know, your time is being maximized. And I feel like that is definitely a reference point to it. And then also the edict, the rule, the Boimler effect rule traveled all the way into the very far future and became this, you know, widely known construct of him being the laziest person in all of Star Trek, Starfleet. That, that is the temporal edict. It's this time traveling rule that went through all of time, but it also deals with time. It's like this weird layered joke. So it wasn't directly related to, you know, tachyons and flying through, a, you know, a, a, you know, a rift to go save the Borg you know, from, you know, stop the Borg from say, you know, killing Earth, you know, and just stopping Zeph from Cochran's first flight or whatever. This was just about this rule. And it was a bit of a play on words as well, because it was a rule about time that traveled through time, which was a rule that people know about in regards to time, about being the laziest person with their time. So it's a time rule. And I thought it was really great. And I thought that was very clever and very much a way to subvert Trekkie's expectations. Because again, when you say temporal, we think time travel, but that wasn't necessarily what happened. 
All right, guys and gals, that does wrap up my review video for today. I know this was a bit long. Again, these probably are only going to get longer the more intricate and detailed these episodes get because I keep gushing about everything. But I did want to go ahead and get this information out there for you guys so we could all talk about it in the comments down below. So what did you think about this episode? Did you like the crystal creature? Do you like the crystal beings? Do you like the idea of the whole time situation? Do you like the idea of... You know, you know, boy, they're getting this cool plaque and being remembered by that uh, from all time. And do you agree that Miles O'Brien is the most important person in Starfleet? Let me know what you think about that down in the comments and below. Go ahead and get the conversation started. Live long and prosper, my trickies!